Paul, you're a member of the European Parliament, a very prominent member, I should say. You're a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, among other things, which is looking at the sustainable finance issues and the context within finance. You're also the chair of the subcommittee on taxation, which in a way plays partly into this as well. And I know and always see you're very, very active on the agenda around sustainable finance and holding companies to account on that. And therefore, it's a real pleasure to have you as an elected representative to start us off. When I spoke to you a few weeks ago, you were one of the first who had actually read the report and have been very, very complimentary. And so therefore, I think it's very, very nice to have you to start this. Over to you, Paul. Thanks for being with us on your very, uh, you know, taxing, well, maybe it's the wrong word, taxing, your very demanding schedule. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my first reaction was not as eloquent as it may have been, but it was more something like, yeah. Uh, not eloquent, but very heartfelt. Uh, I think a better response was uh, from uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, who welcomed the report by the high-level expert group by, with the words, zero tolerance, for, zero tolerance for net zero greenwashing. That is more eloquent. But like I said, my, my first response to the report was, uh, was very welcoming uh, also. Because this is the report, this report is exactly what we need. And I'm glad to open this, uh, this day of uh, hopefully fascinating discussion by elaborating why. Um, and of course, my experience has largely, has largely been shaped by the EU sustainable finance agenda. Uh, and I will focus on the role of transition plans in this agenda. Um, the lessons learned in the EU apply more broadly. I like to think um, EU's experience in defining what is green, uh, in greening asset managers, insurers, in creating a disclosure framework and a labor regime, they have broad relevance. Um, I, I like to think so. Um, so I start by outlining some of the challenges we faced uh, in the European Union and by indicating why I now think uh, transition should be placed front and center. I will then move to, uh, to the present, indicating how transition plans are increasingly taking shape within the EU. And I will then take a more in deep uh, depth look uh, in what, and what transition plans should look like and highlight some of the things that I think are key in the UN's report we are uh, discussing today. But, but let's start with uh, the first, uh, by, by looking back a bit. What lessons did we learn on the importance of transition? And it was roughly, Five years ago, the EU sustainable finance agenda kicked off. It was with the publication of a report by another high-level expert group. This one was created by the Euro Commission to provide a plan for making markets more sustainable. Pushed, I like to think so, uh, by the European Parliament, because in the days that I started, the main hype was the capital market union. And, and my political group says, what about a sustainable capital market union? We tried to push the commission as hard as we could and was glad to see that the high level expert group, the EU one, came forward in 2018. Um, and in fact, they came up with uh, a great deal of great ideas, uh, which many of which are now implemented. Uh, the disclosure regulation, the taxonomy, corporate disclosures, others are on the verge of being implemented. Uh, the green bond standards could see a compromise reach next week. That's what I hope, what we hope for, that could be the next trilogue. Uh, great progress has been made, and but let's be honest, uh, lessons were learned, and a big one is the role of transition, or the emphasis on transition. And ahead of this speech, preparing this speech, I look back at the report from the HLAC on sustainable finance. Uh, HLAC is the well-established well acronym in EU lingo, in EU speak, so please allow me to use it here too. And I look for the role they attribute to transition plans. I found transition plans only were only men mentioned once uh, as a potential use of the taxonomy. And that is, interestingly enough, not one of the ways in which the taxonomy is being used, but more on that later. I'm still not sure if I'm really surprised by the minor role of transition plans in that, record, that report, because also for me, uh, transition plans became front of mind only later, only after uh, to, uh, 2018. Uh, in fact, in the negotiations on the disclosure regulation and on the taxonomy regulation, transition plans, or indeed transition in general, had a very minor role to play. And that was 
2019 to 20. Uh, we were so focused on transparency and on defining green that we did not discuss the transition much or indeed transition uh, in general. Uh, it was about being green, not about becoming green. And of course, there's a rationale to this. To figure out the route, you need to first to know, need to know the destination. Uh, and without the relevant data flows in a financial system, it will be difficult to assure any route is being followed. But still, I think our focus on being green instead of becoming green has led to problems, to issues. The standards for, for the taxonomy regulation, for example, can only be adhered to by the greenest companies in our economy. We don't have clear, definitive data, but estimates are that only 5% of our economy is taxonomy aligned. So how impactful is a measure that only appeals to those that are already doing great, that are already doing green? Even though it might not appear so at first, I think also some of the problems in the sustainable finance disclosure regulation can be brought back to the lack of the transition element, especially the struggles with exclusions from Article 8 and Article 9 projects and the light green funds and the dark green funds. Because we have seen a massive success, um, more, much more than we expected in 2019, of over 50% of all the assets in the EU are Article 8 or Article 9 product. Most in 8, but still over 5% is in Article 9, the deep green category. And interestingly, this, their success is holding up during a market turmoil. Uh, Morningstar shows that during the downturn this year, most funds declined, but the size of assets in Article 9 products increased. Yet, there are growing worries about the greenness of those green funds, even of the deep green Article 9 products. Uh, recent media reports by Handelsblatt, Le Monde, Pays, and others show that half of all uh, Article 9 products invest in companies with significant exposures to coal and other fossil fuels. So how green are they? Some green funds have said that they invest in such companies in the hope that they can change them. But is this indeed a viable strategy? Or is it actually a sign of an unhealthy relationship doomed to end in tears? Funds are clearly struggling whether to engage or divest. From the outset, it seems the greener the better. But how much are you helping by only financing companies that are green already? I repeat that. Sure, it can hopefully expand with relative relatively cheap funding and increase their market share, but the market share will remain relatively small because we start from a small market share. It would be much better to make a big brown company green. We need a way to measure engagements to ensure when green funds invest in brown companies, that is um, as, a, as a product lead uh, to uh, a greening of that brown company. And what is a better way to do that to have transition plans? Summary, we didn't start with transition plans, but over time, transition plans have become more central in the thinking uh, and also in, uh, in the legislation. Because this is why uh, transition plans should be in the center of EU policymaking. And the lack of transition elements has undermined the SFDR and the taxonomy, and it's a lesson we had to learn and I believe many have learned. We can see this in how transition plans are being used in other pieces of regulations. At the moment, the discussions are most heated, I think, in the green bond standard. And the green bond standard is a label that can be used by bonds, the proceeds of which are used to finance green activities. These can be assets that already exist, green loans, for example, or assets that are still being built, let's say the construction of a wind farm. This makes the green bond standard a real transition tool. It doesn't matter if the firm is brown or not. It matters if they are doing green things. But many investors don't see this as enough. Uh, National Nederlander and N investment partners, for example, looked at green bonds and found that 15% of them are issued by companies that are engaged in very polluting activities. And by offering these companies good finance condition, financing conditions, for their green activities, you are helping them to free up funds for their polluting activities too. So the parliament pushes for the transition plans in the green bond standards as a way to bridge this gap between being a brown business uh, with green activities and being a green business. The idea is 
green bonds should help a business achieve its Paris aligned transition. If they don't help a company transition, bonds are not really green. That's the idea. In including transition plans in the green bond standards, Parliament puts center stage something that is already included in other legislation. There are plans in the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. This directive mandates that companies make public the plans of the business to align with the Paris Agreement and the EU's climate law. And IFREC, the European Standard Center, has already proposed standards for them, clearly outlining how a company should report and assess their alignment with the Paris Agreement. And given the work of the UN HLAC, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on these standards and hope we can encourage the European Commission to take over the recommendations by IFREC in full. The obligation in the CSRD, uh, the reporting directive, is a reporting obligation and not an obligation to make transition plans. However, the corporate sustainability due diligence directive, which is currently under negotiation, will make the creation of transition plans mandatory. Simultaneously, efforts are underway to have transition plans for banks and insurers. The European Central Bank and the Europe's insurance regulator, IOPA, are pushing for such plans. For them, it's clear if financials, financial institutions don't move, they will fail and financial crisis will be the result. We have already bailed our banks once. I distinctly remember that. And that was for the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. Let's do everything to prevent having to bail them out for a climate crisis. Uh, I'm sure we have better uses for our money if it gets that far. Now, all this begs the questions. What should transition plans look like? The different efforts in, on the way in the EU show that we also need different types of Transition plans, plans for banks and insurers will be different from those of real economy firms uh, or of those of local governments. But common factors are certainly there, and I think the high level expert group did a great work in identifying these. Let's focus, let me focus on four points. First, the problem I alluded to already, whether to exclude or engage. When it comes to fossil fuels, the HLAC report is very clear. Coal exit by 2030 in the OECD countries and no new exploration and production of any fossil fuels. Companies can still have exposures to coal or fossil fuels for now, but not for very long. The standards in these reports can also form the basis of any update to the SFDR framework, uh, disclosure and uh, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. I can imagine that dark green article nine products can still invest in companies with fossil fuels exposures as long as they adhere to a good transition plan. And then it's up to the investment fund to advocate and monitor this adherence or divest. The second point is the importance of external verification. I strongly support the key role given to third party checks by the HLAC. They shall document whether actors are on or off track in their net zero pledges and verify carbon emissions. It's also key that the external reviewers are involved on a regular basis. This is, for example, already required by the CSRD, where auditors have to provide a limited assurance on transition plans regularly. Third, the broad views of companies' uh, activities is important. Um, not just their money generating business can contribute to climate change, but also their advocacy business, their remuneration policy, and their voting strategy. I like to think, I'm an economist by training, that firms should put their money where their mouth is and remuneration that does not include sustainability factors or advocacy with or for unsustainable causes is simply incompatible with a net zero pledge. This is something we still need to integrate better in the EU. When discussing the, 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 the SFDR four years ago, I only managed to include transparency on the remuneration and voting strategy. But transparency is not enough, is it? But in the update of the SFDRs, this has to be strengthened. And fourth uh, element, uh, I want to highlight the just transition. Here, I greatly appreciate what the HLAC tried to do. Focus not just on climate change, but also on deforestation, on biodiversity, and looking not just at developed countries, but also at how developing countries can be helped. Of course, this is a very challenging part of the work for fighting climate uh, change has become rel relatively obvious, reduce emissions, how to promote other environmental objectives is much harder to quantify and the social element is even harder. And there, 
shouldn't stop us, but that's the situation. And there, I'd like to come back to something I already mentioned above, the connection between the EU taxonomy on the one hand and the transition plans on the other. Because currently, the two are developing in parallel. That is good because the development of the taxonomy is slow and politically complicated, and we should not let this derail a rapid implementation of transition plans. But it's bad because the transition to a sustainable economy is not just about carbon emissions. We should push companies to transition not just to emit less CO2 or other greenhouse gases, but also to be more circular, not to pollute water, to protect biodiversity. That's why in the Greenwald Standard, we emphasize the transition in two ways, not just via a bond's contribution to the issuer's transition plan, but also via its expected contributions to the taxonomy alignment of the uh, issuer. This encourages companies to transition on environment, uh, environmental objectives of the EU taxonomy. So I would like to see in the future a stronger link between the transition plans and the taxonomy. And one of the essential elements is, uh, in that is to create a full-scale economy, which makes companies report not just their green activities, but also their brown and amber ones. With a significant harm criteria, we have already standards to implement this relatively easily. The problem is, of course, political. It's much more comfortable to show how green you are than to show how brown you are. But by coupling the stick of reporting on brown with the carrot of encouraging transitional investments in a transition from brown to amber, it should be politically feasible. Because by doing this, you give access to sustainable finance to a whole range of companies that are currently excluded. This legal framework will allow Europe to build robust transition plans that are no, not focused on just CO2 emissions, but on a wide scope of environmental objectives and hopefully in the future on social objectives. So to conclude, there's plenty of work to be done. I always say this is work in progress and let's keep on working. But strengthening the framework for transition plans in the EU, expanding the taxonomy to link to these efforts and putting transi transition plans center stage in other rules, be they the Green Bond standards or the banking regulation. I'm optimistic on the direction of travel. Optimistic because we know from the start, this is not gonna be easy. Developing the first sustainable finance framework in the world be a process of trial, error, but also progress. We have tried a lot, and indeed, we have sometimes been surprised by the impact of our work. Sometimes the success was uh, bigger than we thought. But we have also learned from the past, and reports like the one by the UN HLEC help us to learn, to take stock, yeah. learn the lessons, and look forward. To learn that focusing on being green is not enough, it's about becoming green. And the report provides great tools to improve upon earlier mistakes. With the taxonomy, we have set a dot on the horizon, and with the SFDR and the CSRD, we have the data to map the Cs. The net, net zero transition plans, as outlined by the HLAC, are the roadmap. It's time to set sail and to go quickly towards a fully sustainable economy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul. Coming from Kiel in northern Germany, I liked your analogy to sailing at the end. Plus, it's very environmentally very friendly. Thank you for this introduction. I think uh, we couldn't have asked for a better scene setter for the discussion, uh, the way you covered the broad aspects and the history and the important role of the Parliament in this process. And we hope that the Parliament will continue its important role. And we wish you all the luck next week in the trilogue on green bonds. It will be a nice pre Christmas present. So, okay. all the best. Thank you. It will not be easy, I know. So, good luck with that. Thanks. And uh, thanks for being with us. <laughs>